The purpose of this series is to provide an overview of select vintage and modern games, their pros and their cons, and what were the essential books and items that you need to play them. With different editions, multiple games appearing to be similar on the surface, and a huge variety of supplements and expansions, newcomers, and even some veterans, can often find it a daunting and confusing place to be. And this series hopes to lend a helping hand. Growing up in the 1970s and the early 1980s, there were a handful of things on TV that I was allowed to stay up past bedtime for. The Prisoner, The Avengers, no, 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 the original ones, that's better, weird spaghetti westerns and James Bond movies. The first Bond I saw at the cinema was 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me, and I've been to see every one of them since including Never Say Never Again, a movie that will play a small part in our story today. I have read all of Fleming's Bond novels, and most of those from a variety of authors that came after him. The cars, the gadgets, the often insane plots, the witty one-liners, all of it. The James Bond character is one that is writ large on my mindscape. So when, in 1983, an advert appeared in the pages of White Dwarf for a new role-playing game, Victory Games James Bond 007, role-playing in Her Majesty's Secret Service. I was obviously going to bite. And so, ahead of the release of No Time to Die, here we are. For a long time, Avalon Hill was the name in board wargaming. They were massively successful and influential with many now-revered game designers cutting their teeth within the pages of its house magazine, The General, and famously rejecting a little innovative role-playing game called Dungeons & Dragons. It is perhaps the subsequent success of D&D, and the company that was founded to publish it in the face of this rejection, TSR, that Avalon Hill began to explore the role-playing concept a bit more seriously within the 1980s. This would lead to games such as Powers and Perils and Lords of Creation, as well as working with Chaosium on an edition of RuneQuest. See my video for third edition RuneQuest. Link in the description. But it also led to one of the most short-lived yet successful and well-received games using a license to franchise. Although the game would not be released directly under the Avalon Hill brand. Over the course of the early 1980s, Strategic Publications Inc., or SPI, found itself in debt to TSR, and this led to TSR pur purchasing that company outright in 1982. Avalon Hill reacted to this by hiring a number of SPI's design staff, forming a new company, Victory Games, around them. It was this company that, with the help of its parent, managed to secure a licence from Aeon Productions, Danjak SA and Glidrose Publications Limited, which meant that they had a licence covering both novels and movies to James Bond. The fly in the ointment came in the form of Kevin McClory, who had previously won a lawsuit against Aeon Productions, resulting in McClory having exclusive rights to the fictional Spectre organisation and its primary figures, including Ernst Stavro Blofeld. This whole mess began with the novel Thunderball, a Fleming Bond novel based on a screenplay that Fleming, McClory and Jack Whittingham had written. To simplify the whole affair, uh, Fleming sold exclusive rights to make movies from his novels to Aeon via Dunjack Holdings. Uh, McClory sued, stating that he had already had movie rights, particularly with respect to Thunderball, which was initially intended to be the first Bond movie. Aeon appeased McClory by giving him sole producer credits for the 1965 Thunderball movie. Aeon continued to use Spectre in later movies, up to Diamonds Are Forever, to which McClory resurrected his legal challenge. Aeon retired Spectre and Blofeld quite spectacularly in the opening of 1981's For Your Eyes Only, although not by name, by dropping Blofeld, or rather an unnamed, distinctly Blofeld-like character, down a chimney. McClory essentially remade Thunderball in 1983 as Never Say Never Again for Warner Brothers. Sony bought McClory's rights in 1997, intending to make their own Bond series, but lost lawsuits against MGM and Danjak. 
McClory died in 2006, and with his heirs ultimately selling his rights to Aeon, both Spectre and Blofeld could once more appear in the primary Bond series of movies. Well, <clears throat> there's more to that whole thing than this, and if you'd like me to make a video going through the whole saga in more depth, then comment below. Regardless, from our gaming point of view, it meant that neither Spectre nor Blofeld could appear in the James Bond role-playing game, which did leave the gaming Bond without an arch-nemesis. Of course, Smirsh was still a possibility, and was described in the game. But Smirsh had a specific focus, while Spectre was a much more wide-reaching organisation. So, instead of having Bond do without, the game developers came up with the Tarot organisation. Technological accession, revenge and organised terrorism. As opposed to Spectre, Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge and Extortion. Under the leadership of Karl Ferenc Scorpius. Basically, Tarot was Spectre, in all but name. The basic game came out in October 1983, including The Island of Dr. No as an introductory adventure, released in a single book and as a box set variant that added record sheets and dice. Alongside this release came Q Manual, effectively a book of equipment, gadgets and vehicles, a Game Master's pack with a screen, reference sheets and cardboard stand-up figures, and the Adventure Pack's Goldfinger and Octopussy. The Adventure Pack series presented a number of scenarios based off the Bond movies, with certain plot elements altered to prevent players familiar with the movies from making them a cakewalk. With a couple of exceptions, each adventure was presented in a slimline box, containing a main scenario book, a for-your-eyes-only envelope containing handout materials to start the players off, and a number of additional handouts representing clues the players could pick up as they progressed. As a presentation for an espionage and investigative play, this format was brilliant. After Octopussy came Doctor No, You Only Live Twice, fun fact, my favourite Bond movie, and Live and Let Die in 1984. Goldfinger 2, The Man with the Midas Touch, The Man with the Golden Gun, and A View to a Kill in 1985, You Only Live Twice 2, Back of Beyond, and For Your Eyes Only in 1986, and On Her Majesty's Secret Service, a set of solitaire adventures in 1987. Supplements and play aids were also produced, including For Your Information in 1983, which was a rules expansion, Thrilling Locations in 1985, which provided information and maps for trains, casinos, cities and other locations suitable for Bond-esque adventure, and Villains in 1986, which provided some more bad guys for the players to defeat, and rounded out Smirsh. And after five years, that was it. Victory Games and the Bond license holders failed to come to an agreement with respect to continuing their relationship, and the game ceased publication. Apart from a brief blip in 2003, where Victory Games, now owned by Wizards of the Coast under their acquisition of Avalon Hill, released a playtest adventure based on For Russia With Love. The game was no more, and for some reason, the Bond franchise has never been revisited since. And that is where we end our history. Victory Games and James Bond role-playing game arrived, conquered the espionage role-playing game market by overtaking TSR's top secret, remained at the top of for a few years, and then went. The fickle life of games based on licences. The core mechanic for the James Bond RPG is a skill-based percentile one. Characters have five characteristics, strength, dexterity, willpower, perception and intelligence, which range from 1 to 15. Aptitudes are represented by skills, which also possess a level from 1 to 15. Each skill has a primary chance, which is derived from a formula involving characteristics and skill levels. For example, fire combat, the skill used for firing guns, has a formula of dexterity plus perception divided by 2. A character with a dexterity of 10 and a perception of 8 and 5 levels in fire combat could therefore have a primary chance of 14. To this, an ease factor is applied to represent the difficulty of a particular task. 
for the most difficult tasks having an ease factor of one half, to the easiest having an ease factor of ten. This is applied as a multiplier to the primary chance to derive a success chance. So our character with a fire combat primary chance of fourteen would have a success chance of seven, with an ease factor of one half, seventy with an ease factor of five, and one hundred and forty with an ease factor of ten. This success factor is rolled against、uh, using percentile dice on a quality results table. No modifiers are generally made to this roll. A roll of one hundred or double O is always a failure. The success chance is looked up on the quality results table, and the dice roll is cross-referenced to find the quality rating of the roll. There are four quality ratings: excellent, very good, good, and acceptable, and of course a fifth one that represents failure. Going back to our example, if we rolled a forty-three for an ease factor of five, we can cross-reference the success chance of seventy against the roll of forty-three to see that it falls within a range of thirty-six to the success chance, and therefore, from the table, we get an acceptable quality rating. All of that sounds more complicated than it actually is in play. Primary chances are calculated ahead of time, so there really is only the multiplication with the ease factor,、uh, the results of which are tabulated for ease of reference, and the quality of results table to manage. For combat, characters begin with an, a base ease factor of five, to which are added and subtracted modifiers for the weapon used, the range, movement, surprise, cover, and so on, to determine a final ease factor for a given attack. The quality rating, cross-referenced with the damage rating of the weapon, provides a wound level from stun to killed. Added into this mix of skills are hero points. These can be used by a character to change aspects of a given situation. You can spend hero points to increase the quality rating of your own rolls, or decrease that of the enemies, which in combat can be life-saving. You can even spend hero points to cause shifts in weather patterns, if the situation and the game's master allows. And that's the basics. For character generation, all of these factors, plus height and weight and appearance, are determined by expenditure of generation points. Choices result in the generation of fame points, which correlates to how easy your character is to pick out of a crowd. The number of generation points available is determined by the agent rank that you are starting at. Rookie provides three thousand points, and up to double O, which provides nine thousand. And that's it. Everything else is a nuanced application of the basic skill system. And once you are used to it, it's a breeze. James Bond 007, role playing in Her Majesty's Secret Service, provides a fast-paced system that effectively recreates the action of a Bond movie around the tabletop. It drew some ideas from previous espionage role-playing games. For example, the fame and fortune points of Top Secret correlates somewhat to the hero points of the Bond game. However, with a more streamlined overall system. Better presentation, and obviously the tie-in to the Bond franchise, the implementation of the Bond RPG was far less clunky than the aforementioned alternative. What really makes the game are its adventure supplements. These set it apart from most RPGs, and especially those within its genre. From the for your eyes only envelope for initial handout to the plethora of additional handout material, these were a joy both to run and to play. And、all in all, I would say that the game is not my favourite role-playing game, but it is my favourite of the espionage genre, and most definitely my favourite within the Bond franchise. I mean, seriously, a potential game franchise license left fallow for over thirty years. The James Bond 007 role-playing in a Majesty's Secret Service basic rulebook is the.、Uh, The only absolute essential, but I would definitely add Q manual to it as required. After that, nothing additional is needed. But regardless, if you're interested in Bond or espionage games in general, hunt down the adventures. Of course, like all licensed lapsed games, none of these books are in print, so an eBay and second-hand store hunt would be in order. A relatively simple core mechanic 
that allows players to jump into the action with some fantastic production put into the adventure supplements, the James Bond RPG could inform many of the current games of the espionage genre around today. It is a fun game that effectively captures the -the over-the-top action of the Bond movies and novels, while stretching the investigative minds of players at the same time. One of role-playing gaming's lost gems. So that's been my overview of the James Bond 007 role-playing and a Majesty's Secret Service game from Victory Games, who were a subsidiary of Avalon Hill. And if you've enjoyed this retelling, then like, subscribe, share, all of that kind of stuff. Comment below on if there's any games that you would like me to go over and have a look at the other ones that we've gone over so far. Uh, Other than that... Um, If you're going out to see No Time to Die, I hope you enjoy it. As of of recording this video, I haven't yet seen it. Apparently it's my 51st birthday present. So I await in trepidation to see what it's like. Enjoy. Until the next time.